Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to worship with us. As you know, as I say every week, there's a lot of places you could be. And the fact that you have chosen to be here is something that we appreciate and do not take for granted. So thank you so much uh, for that. I do want to say if you're a guest here with us today, uh, if you'd like some more information about the church, maybe this is your first Sunday here, maybe you've been a guest for a while, uh, there's a couple things you can do. In the pew in front of you, you'll see a guest card. You can fill that card out, and then as you leave today... As you got those middle doors there at the Welcome Center, there's a basket there for tithes and offerings. You can drop that uh, card in there, and then we can respond, phone call, email, whichever you would like us to do. Or you can just cut out the paperwork and send me an email, uh, john, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org. It's a lot of letters, I know. J-O-H-N, that's the correct way to spell John, for all you people that leave the H out, and those of you who are watching online, J-O-H-N at mycbcc.org, and then I can respond uh, to that email. And so, once again, I just want to thank you guys for being here tonight, uh, for being here this morning. Pay attention to the things there in your bulletin on the left. A couple things I want to do uh, before we get started. One is for us as a church, and then after that I want us to spend some time uh, in prayer for the world and, and for, uh, for the Ukraine. But uh, as you know, a few months ago we were blessed when, uh, when Teresa came on board as our operations coordinator. She's done a wonderful job, uh, but like the Lord does, he tends to throw things at us that we're not expecting and bring opportunities our way that we are not expecting. And so uh, Teresa got what I referred to as a, uh, a godfather offer, a offer she could not refuse career-wise, and so she is uh, going to be stepping down as, as our operations coordinator. We are so grateful for her time here. She's done a wonderful job. This is a very difficult decision. Uh, she and Alan really uh, agonized over this because they love the church. And, and she even liked working with us in the office, y'all. Can you imagine? Uh, put up with me and the rest of us. And so we're just so grateful. Uh, tomorrow, is, tomorrow is her last official day in the office. She will stay on through March, uh, continuing to work from home and taking care of finances and doing all that kind of stuff. But I just want to say how grateful I am for Teresa and her time here and the things that she has done. The Lord has somebody uh, in mind to, to take this position. We're already in the process of looking for that person and, and those kinds of things. But tonight, as you can see, the very first thing in your bulletin is the staff appreciation reception. I know you want to make sure that you say something to her for, for her service to the church. They're not going anywhere. Uh, Teresa and Alan, they're here, and, and this is their church. And like I said, that made this decision very difficult. I'm speaking on their behalf. I'm telling you things that she has, uh, as they have said to me. But I'm just so grateful uh, for what she's been able to do in the, uh, in the months that she has served. And so be praying for them uh, and for her as she transitions to uh, her new company. And pray for whoever the Lord has in mind uh, to come in and, uh, and to fill this position, so, but, but we appreciate that. And so the other thing I want us to do today is, in fact, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to take my phone out. I try not to do that, but I want to read you something. Uh, you know, the Ukraine and all that's going on on the other side of the world, I don't know if you know this, but there's a very strong Baptist presence in the Ukraine. They have a seminary over there and a lot of churches and a lot of, a lot of Southern Baptist churches all throughout our country go to the Ukraine and serve and train pastors and, and do all of that. So there are many, many brothers and sisters in Christ that right now are, are in harm's way. Uh, and so, but I want to read to you something that the president of the Ukrainian Baptist Theological Seminary said earlier in the week. Here's what he said. The question was about, you know, about the invasion and Russia taking over and what, would be, what that's going to be like if, if they're victorious. And here's what he said. He said, the church will go underground. We had that under the Soviet Union. The church did not forget what it means to be persecuted. We will rearrange, reorganize, and do what we always do, preach the gospel. Guys, that's courage. That, that, is, that is somebody that you and I, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that we're going to be in heaven with. And it, it is tragic to see what's going on throughout the world and, and so many people. The courage uh, of the Ukrainians, the patriotism that we have seen uh, has been inspirational. And so I want to pray now uh, for, those, for the people there and for the conflict there and, and for our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, who, are, who are in harm's way and yet... And I've even seen this on Twitter and other things. They, they went to church today. 
if they could get there and the, and the building was standing, they, they had church in the midst of all this. I've seen pictures of soldiers, people in their fatigues who serve in churches, who were meeting with their churches today and then going back out and taking up arms. And so it's just it's an amazing thing to watch. So, so let's pray now and then we'll sing together. Father, we, we thank you for our nation. We thank you for the freedom that we have. Lord, we thank you that today we came here uh, without fear of persecution, without fear of, of war uh, and violence around us. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. But, Father, we pray especially this morning for our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Ukraine. Lord, watch over them. Keep them safe. Lord, we pray for those that are fighting and defending their nation. Lord, we pray that you would bring an end to this conflict. Lord, we, we just ask you to bring peace, to bring a resolution. But, Father, within our context today, we pray for those that are our family because of the blood of Christ. We pray that they would continue to do what they've always done, to stand up and to proclaim the gospel with boldness. Lord, give them opportunities in the midst of a difficult, difficult situation to live for you, whether it's in the midst of the rubble, if the building is still standing, if it's in the streets, whatever they're doing as they proclaim the gospel, Lord, remind them that, that you love them and that Christians throughout the world are praying for them. So we pray ultimately, Lord, that you would glorify yourself through this very difficult situation. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we worship together, would you stand with us, please, as we sing Amazing Grace, Sweet the Sound. Psalm 52, <clears throat> and it's pretty short. The header on it says, The steadfast love of God endures. And what it does, it compares basically how, you know, Scripture tells us that God opposes the proud but favors the humble. And in this passage, in this, this, uh, this Psalm 52, it shows us basically how God will interact with those who are living out flagrant wickedness, those who are, are living out 
basically opposing the kingdom of God, opposing God's people, opposing what is right. And it compares that <clears throat> to God's enduring love for the believer, and it describes it in a really beautiful way toward the end. Um, but I'm just going to read it now for you. It says, it says, Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. Selah. Your love, <clears throat> your, you love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear, and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly.
Uh, amen. Uh, praise God for peace and his love and the joy that he gives us. Something that will last us, right? Not as the world gives, but uh, what Jesus gives to us. We praise God for that. As we come to pray today, let me let families know that we have children's church available, okay? Especially if you're a guest with us, uh, we have uh, children's church up through uh, fourth grade. And so once I get done praying, they can go and meet us in the back of the sanctuary and we'll go to the children's area. Does that sound like a good plan? Yes, for two or three of us. <laughs> right, we're ready for children's church today. But I am thankful for our Covenant Kids team. If you'd like to be a part of it, please talk to me about it. Uh, what an opportunity to share the gospel with ch uh, children, boys and girls of all ages. And it's an important responsibility we have, and we'd love to have you as part of that team. But praise God for those working with them. Let's pray together at this time. Father, I just want to thank you this morning for your constant presence, uh, that you are with us. I'm reminded of what David said in Psalm 23. And I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And Lord, that means so much to our hearts today, to know that we're not alone, to know that you are with us, that you lead us and guide us. And we just thank you for your love and your care for each and every one of us gathered here today. Father, I thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who died to rescue us from our sins out of your great love. And Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives in us, and guides us even now as we worship you. We are dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit in our worship together. As we come and, and worship you, we're reminded that we fall short of your glory. Father, For all we, we are all a work in progress. We are becoming more and more like Christ. And Father, the desire of our hearts is to be more like you. We want to be holy. We want to be loving. Uh, we want to just share the peace of the gospel with others. Help us to do that. I pray that our time together would strengthen us for all that you've called us to do. May the preaching of your word be a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit today with conviction. And Lord, I pray that our response would be faithful, uh, just to respond in faith and obedience as you've called us to. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for our guests who gathered here today. We look forward to what you're going to do, and we'll give you the praise for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us again as we say, please? How deep the Father's love, a relatively new hymn, and the choir will be coming down in just a moment. Don't let them distract you.
Thank you, Brother Bill. Thank you, choir. Uh, I have told y'all before, if I ever write a book on uh, pastoral ministries, I'm going to call it Shower Heads Only Break on Sundays um, because of a particular incident that happened uh, to me one time. But I just want to say this has been, from a technical th uh, viewpoint, one of those Sundays. A lot of you, you can't see it because people have stepped up and have done what they need to do to get things ready and make sure everything runs smoothly. But I just want to thank everybody who's involved with everything that happens up here on the platform, from the guys in the booth to the, the ones who are at the computer to the choir to, to those who play the instruments. There's a lot of things that go into Sunday morning so that we can come in and worship the Lord and he can be glorified. And, and I just appreciate so much uh, all the work that everybody puts into it. Technically, I have the easiest part. I just get up here and talk. Um, everybody else has a lot of different things that are, that are happening. So guys, thank you so much for your dedication uh, and all that you do to make sure that, that our worship service uh, functions the way it does. We just appreciate that very much. So, and, and when you see those folks walking around, be sure you thank them for that. Guys, I want to ask a question this morning. It's a very simple one. What happens when we become Christians? Now, there's a lot of different ways to answer this. There's a lot of different things that happen. You can talk. You can get get into theology and talk about well, we were we were we've been freed from sin. We've been justified. All of those things. And all those things are true. There's a lot of places we could end up when you ask that simple question. But in our text today, there are two things that just stand out as we go through it, and it has to do with our relationship. Our relationship to God and our relationship to the world. So I just want to jump right into it today. So take your Bibles, if you haven't already turned, turn to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 12. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 12. We're just going to look at three verses this morning as we continue to go through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And John has been, in the last few paragraphs, has been reminding us of some things. He's been telling us that if we claim and say we are in the light, then we should walk in the light. And if we don't, then we're actually in the darkness. He has told us if we're genuinely saved, if we know Christ is our Lord and Savior, we will live lives of obedience. We will keep his commandments. And then he also says that if we're genuinely following Jesus, if he is our Lord and Savior, that we will love one another, that if we love God, we will love his people. Well, he kind of pauses, but not really. He, he pauses in, in a way to kind of get poetic for a minute. And he's going to address three groups of people, apparently, but it's really two. Uh, and as, as I'll explain to you in just a minute. And he's going to do it in a way that's a little bit different. It stands out in the text. You're, you're, in your Bible, it might even be set out differently is how the, how the paragraph goes and what he's saying here. So let me read it to you. This is 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Listen for the different groups. He says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. What happens when we become Christians? What happens the moment you repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ? What actually takes place at that point? I want to show you two things this morning, and it has to do, like I said, with relationships. And the first one is this. Our relationship with God changes. Our relationship with God changes. The moment you go from not being a Christian to being a Christian, your eternal relationship with the living God is different than it was the millisecond before that. There's something fundamental that takes place because we have been forgiven of sin. Look at verse 12. He says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Now, let's get our bearings for a minute here. He, he addresses what appears to be three different groups. He talks to little children, he talks to fathers, and he talks to young men. Now, when he uses the word little children, he's already used it in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. He's actually addressing the entire church. This is a very paternal way, a very fatherly way that John would refer to the churches that he's writing to, probably around the area of Ephesus. So he addresses the church when he says little children, he's talking to everybody. And most likely when he re refers, as we go through this text, to fathers and young men, he's talking to the different age groups within the church. Because up until really 
I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago, almost all writing was in the masculine. It, this has been a fairly recent thing where people are talking about gender neutral and that sort of thing. When he's addressing fathers and young men, what I believe is going on is he's addressing the older folks in the congregation and the younger folks in the congregation. He's addressing both of those groups. And what he says about one applies to the other. He's speaking about universal truths within what it means to follow Jesus. So that'll help us as we go through it. But notice how this whole thing starts out. If we don't get verse 12 right... If verse 12 doesn't happen to you, then verses 13 and 14 can't happen to you. Look at verse 12 again. He says, I'm writing to you little children, so to the entire congregation, and here's why, because your sins are forgiven. Now, I mentioned this last week. One of the most important things to keep in mind in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John are the verbs. Verbs are important. And this little, the little word he says to, that we, our sins have been forgiven. The picture is that our sins are forgiven at a, at a specific moment in time. The moment we ask God to forgive us of our sins, right? And place our faith in Jesus Christ. The moment, as we would say, you got saved. The moment you surrendered your life to Jesus. The moment you asked Jesus into your heart. Whatever the, the phrase was or however you explained it, when, whether you're an adult, whether you're a child, whatever it might be, there was a moment in time when you gave your life to Jesus if you're a Christian. You were forgiven. And the, the sense of the word there in the original is you were forgiven at a specific moment and the results of that forgiveness go on and on and on and on and on forever. They are infinite. There will never be a time where you are no longer forgiven if you've truly been forgiven. It doesn't go away. You will always stand in relationship to God having been forgiven of your sins if you have truly done that. And here, here's, here's the little thing. He throws in a caveat here that we've got to keep in mind. He says, I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven. And he says, not because you deserve it. He says, for his name's sake. My salvation and your salvation is primarily not about us. It's about the glory of God. It's about God demonstrating to a lost and dying world that in his grace and in his mercy, he has provided for forgiveness. It's about him and his glory and what he has done for us. And all of these things that we're going to see in verses 13 and 14 begin with verse 12, whether or not we have been forgiven. If you'll remember on the day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit falls on the 120 they began to speak in other tongues. A huge crowd gathers, and Peter stands up, and he preaches the gospel like it's never been preached before, and the, and the crowd gets under conviction. And you remember what they said? They asked a question. In Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38, the Bible says this. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and then here it is, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, how is forgiveness possible? Why is it that I can stand up here and read verse 12 and with full confidence say, if you will repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ, your relationship with God will change? Well, it's chapter 2 of 1 John, verses 1 and 2. Notice he addresses the same group. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus was that sacrifice that was, that was necessary for you and I to be able to be forgiven. He was that perfect, sinless, spotless sacrifice that God poured his wrath upon. That's what propitiation is. God poured out his wrath. Jesus took that wrath for me and for you. And when we give our life to Jesus, when we surrender to him, he is that sacrifice. He is the propitiation. That's how we can be forgiven. In fact, Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So it starts there. 
It starts with forgiveness. It starts with repenting of our sins and placing our faith in Christ. It starts with saying, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And how do we know what sin is? What's well, anything that's contrary to the nature of God? Lying is a sin because God is truth. And so on. So that's what we do. We have to repent of that. We have to ask God to forgive us. And when we do that, that forgiveness then allows us to know God personally. Look at verse 13. Skip down to the bottom of the verse where he says again to this same group, he says, I write to you children because you know the Father. You know the Father. Then he addresses the, the older folks in, in the crowd. Look at verse 14 again. Or we hadn't looked at it again. Look at 14 for the first time. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. And he's already said that in verse 13 as well. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. Do you realize that the moment you gave your life to Jesus, if you're here today and you're a Christian, you can legitimately say, without any sort of exaggeration, without any sort of hyperbole, with, with, with just absolutely just plain words, you can say, I know God. You actually know him. He knows you. You have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe, with eternal God. He mentions both times, he says, who is from the beginning. But that's not how we come into this world. We come into this world separated from him. We come into this world without that relationship. That's why that's, why that's what changes when we give our life to Jesus. Do you remember what Isaiah 59 two says? But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. That's how we come into the world. Separated from God. Lost. On the way to hell. Needing to be forgiven. And the moment we're forgiven, suddenly that whole relationship changes. There's no longer that division. There's no longer that wall. And we get to know him personally. In fact, Jesus defines salvation simply as knowing God. John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus said this in his high priestly prayer, right, right before, I mean, right before he was arrested. He said, and this is eternal life. And that should always make us, you know, perk our ears up. And this is eternal life, that they know you. He's praying to the Father, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We know him. That relationship has changed. Years ago, it's one of my favorite stories. If I've told you before, just act like I haven't. You know, don't tell me later. One of my favorite stories, I, was, is, I think it was my first semester in seminary. And, and many of you are going to find this funny because uh, at one point in your life, you know, Dr. Rogers would have been your pastor. Some of you knew him personally. He was, he was friends with you and that sort of thing. But I had a, a seminary professor who knew Dr. Rogers here in town in the late 70s. And he had served at a church in between college and going to seminary, and they'd gotten to know one another. And he said it was like the late 80s or early 90s or something, right at the height of you know, the conservative resurgence and all the things. And he was at a, at a, maybe it was at the Southern Baptist Convention, whatever it was, it was like this big national meeting. And Dr. Rogers spots my professor and makes a beeline to him and says, oh, how are you doing? And talks to him and hugs him, and they have a good conversation. been years since they've seen one another. And so Dr. Rogers walks off. Well, my professor's kids are standing there, and they're kind of like bug-eyed. And they go, you know him? And he didn't miss a beat. He said, no, no, even more important than that, he knows me. <laughs> That's a very dad response, right? I love that response. But you and I can say, we can say about God himself, the creator of the universe, who spoke the world into existence, who has his hand over everything, we can say, I know him, and he knows me. Because you've been forgiven. If you're a Christian, that relationship, your relationship with God has changed. Second thing I want you to see, the relationship change, and it's simply this, and you can guess it, our relationship with the world changes. Our relationship with the world changes. This world is no longer our home. This is, this is just a stopping off point uh, where we get to serve him until he calls us home. Look at verse 13 again. 
He addresses the young men right in the middle of the verse. He says, I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. That little word overcome there, y'all know that word. In fact, depending on what kind of shoes you have on today, you might be wearing that word. It's the word Nike. N-I-K-E. Probably pronounced Nike, but we call it Nike in the United States. That's the swoosh. It means victory. It says you have victory, young men. You have, and, and once again, it's at some point in the past, you attain victory. It's at the moment of salvation. And the results of that victory go on and on and on forever. It's the same thing as with forgiveness. It is something that you get the moment you give your life to Christ. He says it over again in verse 14. At the end of verse 14, he addresses the same group. He says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Knowing God brings spiritual victory. That's what we have. It suddenly changes our relationship with the world. He mentions twice in our paragraph somebody very specific, and that is the evil one, Satan himself. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says this, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes or has victory, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. That's the song we sing, right? Faith is a victory that overcomes the world. That's the hymn. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is, is the Son of God? What we have to understand, guys, is that suddenly this world is not our home. We are now strong. We have overcome the world. And he says something very specific. He says, the word of God abides in you. John here is using a word that he would have heard Jesus use many times, but especially on the night that he was arrested. After they leave the upper room and they're heading towards, towards Gethsemane, Jesus says this in John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And the reason we need this victory, the reason we need this overcoming that he's mentioned in the middle of verse 13 and at the end of verse 14 is because we have an enemy, the evil one. Look at, look at 14 again. It says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Satan. When Jesus is praying, we've already read some verses from it right before he's arrested in John 17, 15, he says this. He's praying specifically for the disciples here. And he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Satan is always up to something. In fact, in 1 John chapter 5, 18 and 19, and we'll get there in a few months, he says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the world lies in the power of the evil one. Y'all know that Satan's always up to something? Y'all figured that out yet? He always has plans. You can see it now. Just, walk, just turn, on the, turn on the news. I mean, it's very obvious right now. Satan is always up to something. In fact, there's a description in the Old Testament of him in Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. that It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And then Peter picks up on this in 1 Peter 5, 8, where he says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And then Paul would write in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, he says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. That's why there has to be victory. That's why we have to have overcome the evil one. And that's why God provides that. Because Satan is out there and he wants to trip you up and he wants to trip me up and he wants to cause destruction. That's what he does. He simply brings destruction and death and all of those things. But here's what we need to remember. Remember the word Nike. Remember the word victory. He's a defeated enemy. He is absolutely a defeated enemy. Do you remember what James wrote? 
James chapter 4 and verse 7, here's what he said. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Then notice, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's an amazing statement when you think about it. Because what is Satan? Satan's a fallen angel. He's a spiritual being. He has power that you and I don't have. He can do things. He can fake miracles and disguise himself as an angel of light and has all, can do all these, these amazing things because of who he is and how God created him. He rebelled against that. But it's, a, it's an amazing thing. He's a fallen angel. And yet we in our humanity and in our you know, weakness can resist him and he will flee. He will run. Y'all hear the beeping? Everybody's looking back. Work, the new system's in. We're still not 100% sure. Uh, they're they're going to track it down, y'all. So let's all acknowledge it for a second. It's beeping. It's annoying. Everybody got it? All right, we'll move on. What are you going to do? Acts chapter 26, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said something to Paul. This is when Paul's giving his testimony about his conversion. Jesus said this to, to Paul on the road to Damascus. He said, Delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The moment you repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ, suddenly your relationship with the world, which is his domain, Satan's domain, changes. You have overcome the world. When I was a uh, freshman in high school, I can't imagine school doing this today. They, they get in trouble, but, you know, this is before things got kind of like they are now. We had this during Spirit Week, you know, before homecoming. We had this thing called Senior Slave Day. And here's what it was. It was that seniors were assigned freshmen. And basically the seniors could just do everything short of torture the freshmen, right? Just humiliate them, do all kinds of stuff. Make them wear stupid things and act dumb. I mean, it was just a weird thing that happened, right? But you've all probably been through things like this. Well, I just really wasn't looking forward to this as a freshman and so that morning of spirit week here comes the guy who's my supposed to be the senior that is assigned to me now I'm 14 this kid's only 17 right he's only three years older than I am he's you know it's I mean so he comes up to me and he says here's what I want you to do and he says this this and this and he had something he wanted me to wear and do this and, and I looked at him and I said no <laughs> so I'm not doing it and then I walked off. And that was the last I heard of him that day. He never came back, right? That tells you a little bit about my personality. Now, he could have, I guess, gone to the, you know, to the vice principal and all that and said, hey, he won't do this thing. And I, I'd have probably done it then, you know, if Mr. Fletcher would have said, you need to do this, you're going to be in trouble. But he never did. Because, I mean, y'all, he was a stupid kid just like me. He had zero authority in my life. None. And I said... No, I'm not doing it. Now, that's a silly example, I know. But Satan comes after you and he comes after me. If you've given your life to Jesus, if you've repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ, you know what you can do? You can just say, no. No, I'm not doing it. Because this world is not our home. We have victory. The moment you give your life to Jesus, the moment you become a Christian, those relationships change. So back to the question. What happens when we become Christians? Well, guys, our relationship with God changes, and our relationship with the world changes. We've been forgiven, and we have victory. Now, believer, let me ask you something today. I'm talking to the Christians in the room now. Are you living life with victory? Are you living life having been rescued from the power of sin? Are you living a life that glorifies God in all aspects of your life? Because you can. Now, let me understand, we're not going to do it perfectly. 
Christ hasn't come back yet. We're not glorified yet. But the Holy Spirit of God lives in you if you're a believer. And that means you can be a godly husband. That means you can be a godly wife. That means you can be a godly parent, grandparent. It means you can be a godly employer, employee. It means you can be a godly neighbor. It means you can serve the Lord and honor him in every single aspect of your life. But here's what I want to challenge you on. Has there, have you allowed something in this world, something you already have victory over, to begin to drag you down? Maybe there's a sin in your life that you haven't gotten right with the Lord. Repent of that. Say, Lord, forgive me. I'm, 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 and I'm sorry for, for living a life that, that does not line up with who you are. And just, just repent of that stuff and walk away from it today. Because you can I understand some sin has, has some addiction issues and, and there you may need some help there. But most of the time in the Christian life, when you and I sin, it's just because we've chosen to. And we just sort of stay there and live it. And we don't make it right. And yet we have victory. Don't live defeated when you're already on the winning side. Don't let it drag you down. Today, walk out of here knowing that you have overcome the world. So it might be during the invitation time, you need to take something to God and say, Lord, forgive me. Or maybe you know a believer who's struggling. Somebody you know that's struggling in their walk with the Lord. During the invitation, pray for them and pray for the Lord to remind them of what they have in him. That they have been forgiven. Their relationship with him has been restored because of Jesus. And they don't have to be sucked into the lies of Satan and the lies of this world. And lift them up in prayer. But I want you to understand this. You can't even begin. We can't even begin to do the things that are talked about in verse 13 and 14 until we get verse 12 nailed down. Have you truly repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ? As you sit here today, are you forgiven? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you don't, today, repent of your sins, place your faith in Jesus, and be saved. Jesus died for you, was buried, and rose again on the third day. And if you'll repent of your sins and call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Forgiveness and victory, that's what happens when we give our life to Jesus. I'm going to pray for us, guys, and then we're going to have our time of response. You may want to come and talk to me. You may want to come to the steps and deal with the Lord. You may want to deal with him right where you are. Those of you who are watching, if you need to send an email, send me an email or send us a Facebook message, and we can respond to that. But the reality is, if you've given your life to Jesus, you have overcome the world you have been forgiven. Let's live like it. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this paragraph. We thank you for what you have given us, what you've reminded us of today. Lord, I pray for every believer in the room, Lord, that we would live lives of victory. Lord, I pray that we would honor you. If there's things we need to get right today, that we would. If we know other believers who are struggling, Lord, I pray we'd lift them up. If there's one here today who doesn't know you, I pray they would call on the name of the Lord and be saved and receive the victory that we have read about in this text. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.